Uh, okay, we're back. Hopefully now you can you can hear me. Um, okay, so what we what you're going to learn today in today's lessons? First is the origins of plate tectonic theory. So a little bit about the history of um, the history of uh, uh, of uh, plate tectonics, the science, the driving mechanism behind geosphere movements, uh, and how plate tectonics work. Uh, how continents have split apart and reassembled, how the Earth system interacts at plate boundaries, uh, and this is uh, also why there are earthquakes, volcanoes, mountains, and the oceans as we have, have them now, and how tectonic processes affect people by creating both natural hazards and vital natural resources. So there are also a lot of positive things about it. Okay, the idea of continental drift. Um, an early idea. It started, believe it or not, in the 16th century when um, people were started making maps and they noticed, hey, uh, South America seems to fit quite nicely uh, into Africa and North America also. Um, so that was the first uh, first ideas. And then the second part, where there are, there are coal deposits uh, around uh, separate continents which have similar fossils. So here is the picture here. Let me um, uh, do a little uh, pointing there. So that uh, fossil is a is a plant called Clasopteris, and it's uh, they all are the same. It's a fern plant. It suggests then, therefore, that uh, the continents were put put together at one one point because the plants were spread across one continent, and they called that continent at the time Gondwana land. Don't ask me why they called it that. I don't know why. Um, maybe an, uh, an extra point for your homework if you uh, if you find that out. What that means, or at least one point. Uh, <laughs> exactly, one point for Danny. Are you are you uh, taking this uh, for your record that you were given a point by uh, Peter? There you go. So let's uh, let's get back to the subject. There was a German scientist. His name was Alfred Wegner. I hope I said that correctly, If uh, so P Peter and Philip can uh, let's say if I get a point for that. Uh, he was the first to formulate a, an, the idea of, of continental drift. So he had, uh, oh, I'm sorry, Luke. He, um, he had this idea, he called it continental drift. Um, however, he wasn't right. I mean, he was right that it, it works that way. But he didn't work. He didn't figure out how it actually worked. He was a little bit ridiculed in his life, as all great scientists they're never understood <laughs> in their lifetime. So what he said. So here are the the uh, different continents fit together. Yeah. He said that uh, uh, separated species. So here you had a, a fossil uh, from South America and Africa. They were found together, and then th the another fossil. Uh, uh, this little, I don't even know sure what it is. It looks like a little, some type of four-footed thing. It was found in Africa and India and the Arctic. Antarctic, sorry. And then here's another one. That's the Glycopteris. And this one here. So he said, looking at the fossils, this is how I think the continents used to look. Uh, so the ages of the rocks were similar. Um, then came up the idea of Pangaea. Uh, at this way, uh, <laughs> Pangaea is Greek. This one I do know, and uh, Rania I think she would also know this one. Uh, it's Greek for all land. Pan is all, and land is Gia. Again, I'm probably mispronouncing it. Uh, you can give me uh, zero points for this also. The collisions combined some continents. So uh, India, for example, if you can if you can watch here, India uh, uh, kind of breaks off and shoves its way into the Asian continent. This is about uh, 250 million years ago, and uh, they've been moving very slowly. And eventually, I hope you do realize this is the current uh, position. Uh, you've uh, hopefully all seen maps of the, of the Earth. The way it is now. So why, do, where was uh, Wegner wrong? His argument uh, that continental drift, 
was because of uh, of like uh, centrifugal forces. Yeah. He, so this is the second point here. So Wegner erroneously proposed that tidal forces generated by Earth spin tugged the continents apart. And um, and the physic physic physicists at the time uh, said he was uh, insane. Although he was right, he just didn't know about how continental drift worked. So it seemed in his lifetime that he was a, a failure, but actually he was proved correct. But just um, it took a couple other Germans to do that. Uh, we'll get to that too <laughs> right now. So how did how do they move? Uh, one of the things that people noticed was not only that the continents seemed to move, but also the magnetic poles seemed to move. So if uh, you can go back, uh, believe it or not, uh, the poles move back and forth. Uh, sometimes the North Pole is positive and the South Pole is negative, and they switch. So that's uh, kind of a, a, an odd thing, but you should know about that. It does happen. It hasn't happened for many thousands of years, though. What they were happening is they, they, they noticed that the poles seemed to wander through the years. The, the North Pole and the South Pole are not always consistent uh, a year after year. All the things that scientists have noted is that the sea floor seems to be spreading. Um, so when this actually came from about World War II, when uh, the uh, the submarines were discovered, people explored the bottom of the ocean more. They noticed magnetic stripes, and then the third one was earthquakes. People tried to explain why there were earthquakes. So exploring the ocean basins, as I mentioned. Uh, here is uh, you, pr you probably don't often see a map of the oceans. We normally look at the land, but here we have uh, the map of the oceans. So after World War II, actually, uh, and also during World War II, people were very interested in the bottom of the ocean. They noticed that in some places there were very deep, what we call trenches. So here you see um, along the Atlantic into the Indian Ocean around Africa. This is another ridge, and uh, here's the Mariana Trench, the A Alaska Aleutian Trench, the East Pacific Crest. Here's another ridge. So they noted a lot of deep places they called trenches, and also elevated things that they called uh, ridges. Yeah, and here's a close-up of the same map, where the red is a ridge, and the blue is a trend tr trench. Um, now, this, like I mentioned, there was another uh, German man who had to prove um, prove a Wegener correct. His name was Harry Hess, who was um, uh, eventually a professor uh, at Princeton University. In 1962, he, he published a book called The History of the Ocean Basins. His idea, and now I'm sure you've probably all heard about it, about uh, uh, how continents separate uh, and, and form trenches and ridges. So his idea was that, um, let me actually, uh, is it better or worse? Probably worse. So his idea was um, was the con that, that, that the crests moved away from each other. So here you see an upwelling of magma. You see this is magma coming up through the, the uh, Earth's surface underneath the ocean, obviously. And this, therefore, pushes one part to the left and the other part to the right. If you remember in maybe previous courses, this part is called, um, do you remember what this part is called? Rift. Hmm? Rift. The what? Rift. No, the, the rift is uh, right here. So it's, it's actually called the mantle. And this is the crust. So you, the Earth's, yeah? Where's my question? I have a question from Manon. This is yeah, cut through, correct. So imagine that this is the entire world, it's circular. Here we have the core. You, it's not pictured here, but here to be the core. Around that is what we call the mantle. And on top of just the very thin part where we walk around on, uh, that's called the crust. So this mantle is popping through the crust, and that's where all the magma is coming from. 
So actually, the, the part that we're walking on, the crust, is, is quite thin. It's only a few kilometers deep, which sounds like it's you know very deep, but on the size of the Earth, it's not deep. But what you see now, right now, is, is like... It's a cross-section of the Earth. The wall, it's like a layer. Yeah, it's okay. like the Earth is cut in half. And we're looking... Yes. If we took a tennis ball, you know, and we cut that tennis ball in half, we're looking at just the top, top part. I understand. Yeah. But on the surface, these are where the ridges are growing. Yeah? And therefore, he states that at mid-ocean ridges, so MORs, there's new oceanic crust which forms. As the lithosphere, lithosphere, that's what the crust is also called, pulls apart, and magma, which is uh, magma is liquid rock, it comes up and it solidifies. And he says all of these things are, uh, these ridges are actually underwater volcanoes. Okay? With underwater volcanoes. And at that time, it, it's again, today this seems very common, but at the time, of course, it was groundbreaking. groundbreaking. And then there's a, a third part. Um, there was another uh, uh, geophysicist, he, this time at Cambridge University in, uh, in the UK. Actually, two of them, Vine and Matthews. What they did is they went on a boat and here you see this little boat, tiny, tiny boat, and they lowered a probe down the boat. And they took this boat and they went back and forth and back and forth and back and forth across these ridges which, um, uh, which Hess talked about. And they noticed that these ridges are sometimes positive and sometimes negative. So like I, when I, like I mentioned, the North Pole and the South Pole, they switch. And we've never, I've never, I'm not 10,000 years old. <laughs> so I've never experienced, nobody alive today has experienced this change of, of polar, but we know it's happened. And it it forms like a barcode, yeah? So when you go into the grocery store and they have barcodes, oh, Luke has a question. How do we know that the polar has changed? Uh, ah, there's, there, there you go. Well, it depends. If you believe that the, the Earth was formed by God, uh, then for some reason we are assuming, uh, you know, that it was created somehow. Yeah, we can we can actually measure the the uh, the, the ground if it's positively charged or negatively charged. We know that because if you, if you take, uh, believe it or not, there is a charge on uh, Earth. We n we've never done that in, in class. Why? Because uh, a very large percent, like three or four percent of the soil, is iron, and that you have proven. Actually, it was it's the first uh, the first class of uh, uh, lab skills is you determine the amount of iron in the soil. It's like three or four percent, which is very high, and this iron has a charge. It's either negatively charged or positively charged, and so people they um, they noticed, oh hey. If we go down the, the layers of the Earth, it's positive, and then it's negative, and then it's positive, and then it's negative. So then, this is, I'm getting, that's actually where I'm getting to, so I'm glad you asked that question. These, uh, <laughs> these, um, these, this barcode along the ocean, I think it's the next sheet even, I'll skip. This barcode of the ocean fit exactly with the barcode of very, very deep, uh, deep uh, canyons, yeah. So here it's I'm going going back. So here it's 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 hor it's horizontal, it's flat, but they're exactly the same as a ridge that's on land. But only this is now vertical, vertically striped, and that's that's how they put it together. So they have this barcode of positive negative positive negative positive negative but it's difficult to age the soil at the bottom of the ocean it's <laughs> you have to deep you have to go down several kilometers and take soil samples it's not so easy but just like we talked about the tree rings from the trees we do the same thing with the with the earth so we look at the positive and negative stripes and correlate this to the soil on the in the in the uh, uh, valleys 
this is, I believe, this is the East African ridge. What do you mean? The soil itself has a charge. Like the, charge. yeah, the, the North Pole, it has a positive charge, and the South Pole has a negative charge. But sometimes, bloop, the North Pole is positive, and the South Pole is positive. It doesn't happen very often. It happens every 100,000 years, plus or minus. We don't know why it happens. We don't know how it happens. We just know what happens. Possibly. There's lots of theories, but no one's proved it. No one. And we, we, we may not ever prove it. Maybe it'll take, maybe it'll happen. That's all the questions. Will the birds suddenly fly the wrong direction? Because they use the magnetic waves to, uh, anyway, we're going slightly off topic. So, uh, oh no, sorry, I, th I said this is the East African Ridge. This is actually the, uh, the uh, uh, this is on Kauai and the Hawaiian Islands. Yeah? Uh, I guess you, we all sent it for the East African Ridge. I know we have, but this one's just um, showing it. So we can date the soils of the ridge. And we then match this from the ridge, I'm sorry, from the, from the, uh, from Hawaii, and then we match it to the ridge, so we know how how old these ridges are. And this was just another proof that um, that Wegner was correct, that Hesse was correct, and 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 now these two guys, uh, Vine and what were they called? I've got the name again. Vine and Matthews, they uh, put this all together. So now with these three evidences, we can, I think definitely uh, uh, agree that this has been an, a fact. Um, so MORs, or mid-oceanic ridges, are quite young uh, by geological standards. They're no more than two million years old. So here you see, it, uh, let me zoom in uh, if you want, this little red part, that's one to two million years old, and that's where all these ridges are. So they're, they're quite young. The older parts uh, are blue. And then we have it over, you know, we're talking about 200, 300 million years ago. That's how old they are. Okay, so um, now to the points I have here. So there's symmetry in the magnetic signature, but also uh, similar symmetry for the age of volcanic rocks. And as I mentioned, red is young and blue is old here. Am I still, uh, can you guys hear me now? Is it better still? I just want to, I want to make sure people are being able to. Okay, good, thank you, Victor. Um, uh, so this is uh, plate tectonics. Now, we're gonna add to this complexity, it's, it's already a little bit complex, but earthquakes. So people said, okay, we understand that this is how it happens, but if you if you zoom into these ridges, they actually, <laughs> better but not perfect. Well, thank you, Peter. Actually, these ridges aren't, aren't perfect. We see these like stripes along the way. Uh, they kind of, they don't go like perfectly straight. They kind of wobble back and forth. Yeah, that's when people start talking about, this is how earthquakes work. Um, if you have two plates and they're, pulling apart, then this causes stress between the two um, parts of the ridge. So um, it's they're pulling apart, but they want to stick together, and then they, they kind of shear apart. And that's why in between there are like jumps. That's when it's splitting apart. Yeah, along along the ridge, it, we uh, it, it's like trying trying to um, uh, I don't know pull something. If three people are pulling in three different directions, it's going to cause tension because they don't pull at the exact same. Um, they're not pull, pulling at the exact same uh, uh, strength. And this is where this Canadian guy, uh, Wilson, he talks about uh, transform faults. And that's where the, you guys may have heard of fault lines before? A fault? Uh, it's an English word uh, meaning, uh, for in, in the United States, the most famous one is the San Andreas Fault. 
So, yeah, and what? And fai in French? Okay, well, I learned a French word today, fai. <laughs> so it's it actually runs uh, perpendicular to um, to the ridges. Yeah. So a, a fault. Uh, okay. Now we learned the German word, verfung. <laughs> oh, no, sorry, for verfung. Um, so these faults run uh, perpendicular uh, to the the uh, to the ridges. Today, we uh, we've now divided the um, globe into different plates, um, but these move very very slowly. Although they have very drastic effects, they actually don't move more than. Uh, a couple of centimeters a year, which is approximately how fast your fingernails grow. Grow, if you're if you're curious, that's how fast they move. Not very fast at all. Um, I mentioned uh, the. Uh, okay, I mentioned we have uh, light now. I mentioned that uh, we have uh, ridges, and this happens not only under underground. Uh, they also can happen, we have rifts and ridges, but not only under water, but also on the ground. Sorry. So this upwelling uh, can be seen in places like here in Africa, the East African Ridge uh, Valley. It's slowly splitting apart. So here we have the uh, Somali plate, it's called, and the Nubian plate. And they're ac it's actually uh, drifting apart. And I have another sheet here. So here's the uh, rift. Uh, this is what it looks like before it starts moving apart. Again, uh, it's uh, it's coming up. The, the magma is coming up. It slowly splits to the right and the left, and in between, an ocean forms. Um, there are also uh, divergent plates um, from spreading centers. D divergent, yeah. So, an, an, well, in a divergent plate, um, it, uh, it it shears this way, yeah. So it's not going this way. One is going down and one's going up. Um, and here we have uh, a picture of underwater of a shear plate. Um, a convergent plate, yeah. Are, are where they are moving together. So you have a divergent plate. It can either go like this. Then you have a convergent plate where they're actually moving uh, like that. So here you have uh, a divergent plate. They're moving away from each other. But this plate moving away uh, makes it go underneath the other plate. So there are three plates here. On the left, you, you see plate A. In the middle, you see plate B. And on the right, you see plate C. And plate A and B are moving away. And plates B and C are moving towards each other. Now, uh, th this is where uh, a lot of uh, uh, earthquakes and uh, volcanoes happen because when this plate moves underneath, it doesn't just take the rocks, it also takes water. Uh, it takes carbon dioxide. And as it goes down deeper into the surface, it uh, is coming under heavy pressure. And uh, the water then, of course, uh, it's just like a steam engine. It, uh, it's under heavy pressure and a lot of lot of heat, of course, and it wants to come up. And this causes a lot of the volcanoes. Uh, of, um, uh, in the, in the, if you're from North and South America, you know this. There are lots of volcanoes on the west coast of uh, North and South America. This is actually called the Pacific Ring of Fire. And it's the same problem that's going on in East uh, Asia. So uh, Mount Punatubo is an example of a volcano that's uh, caused by a convergent plate. Um, a lot of uh, volcanoes around the Pacific are, are because of this. They're actually the, the, uh, the, the heaviest, most of the heaviest volcanoes because of all the water that's being pushed under underground. 
Well, it's not. No, it's not just water, of course. But it's water mixed in with uh, with magma, yeah, which makes it quite powerful. Pressure, no, it's all pressure, but the water causes extra pressure. So um, uh, the vo the volcanic islands are examples. Um, I'll continue. The Himalayas. So I, I mentioned that uh, volcanoes made this way, but not only volcanoes, also mountains. Uh, here we have two plates coming together: the Indian plate and the, uh, the the Eurasian plate, and they caused the Himalayas. A convergent margin uh, creates the the Aleutian Trench in in Africa. Now we have strike slip faults, and uh, going towards the end of uh, this presentation, a strike slip fault because we talked about faults before, or if two plates are not divergent or converging, but they slide past each other. So we've talked about a couple of different things. We have plates moving apart, plates shearing, we have plates going on top of each other, and lastly, we have plates moving in the like the z-axis. It's moving like this. This is called strike-slip faults. I hope you and uh, open like my little hand moves movements. <laughs> uh, could you close that door, please? Just a little bit of a um, little bit of noise in the background. We have some strike slip faults here, uh, and what happens is they move like that. Yeah. Uh, one of these uh, biggest examples of a strike slip fault is the San Andreas fault. And if you look at this picture, these um, this this used to be one fence, yeah. So this fence used to be one fence, and then suddenly there was a, a an event called an earthquake, and it moved these fences apart. So here we have the Baja plate, which includes um, Southwest California and Baja Mexico, moving uh, northwest, while the North American plate is moving southeast and this causes a lot of uh, earthquakes in southern california and also in uh, texas and uh, in mexico and here's another an another example this river used to be a straight line and then there was a uh, uh, there was a, uh, uh, an earthquake and it moved this part moved uh, to the right and this part moved uh, to the left and you can see it very clearly where this happened and um, in the f in the fact of San Andreas fault is quite often the lake because uh, just like we talked about uh, the Rift Valley and continents are moving apart, uh, it's also it's filled up with water. Still going on, right? Yo, yes, of course, so it will always continue. Earthquakes and plate tectonics, and also uh, volcanoes. Uh, like I mentioned here. Most volcanoes happen where two plates uh, converge onto each other. And around the Pacific, this is called the Pacific Ring of Fire, around the Pacific Ocean Rim. But also there's uh, quite a bit of act activity in uh, southern uh, Europe. Anybody know of uh, some volcanoes in South Europe? There's some famous ones. Vesuvius is a famous one, yeah. There's a very active one still. Huh, which? Oh, Stromboli, exactly. And the third one, maybe? Etna, yeah. Yeah, Mount, Mount Etna is also one. So there are, believe it or not, Europe is quite active vol for volcanism, more than, for example, Africa. Yeah. No, that's true. Because, um, as you see, the plates here are moving exactly. So this plate is moving to the east and that's why there's so many volcanoes here and also um, uh, the, the African plate is moving towards uh, Europe so that's why Europe has the um, volcanoes because the African plate is moving underneath the European plate yeah if it went the other way around if the European plate went underneath the African plate then in Africa you would have volcanoes but that's not the case Another devastating effect uh, I want to talk about is um, underwater 
um, earthquakes, uh, which cause uh, tsunamis. And uh, there was a very tragic one in Indonesia in 2004, where uh, 250,000 people died. 250,000? Yes. It was a very big event. It was a global event. And it, they actually happen quite a lot. Mount Punatubo, as I mentioned, is um, is was uh, part of this uh, this Pacific Rim uh, uh, event, the Ring of Fire. But also mountains. So have a, there are a number of ways that can build a mountain. The first is accretion. Uh, this is where it's it just it's it's coming up and up and up. The compression at convergent plate boundaries. So this is where, this is like the Himalayas. Yeah, so there's pressure pushing up, but also pushing down. And the more that they move, one's pushed up more, one's pushed down more. Collisions can actually happen, so they kind of go up like this. Eventually one's gonna win, uh, but they when they first, they kind of meet together and they push up. And also magma, we shouldn't forget about uh, magma. Some uh, some mountains, especially volcanoes, if it's a volcanic mountain, obviously uh, magma buildup will also um, make it grow. And in fact, the fastest growing mountains are volcanoes. There's a couple more sheets. Uh, the last sheet before the the sum up. Um, plate tectonics influences uh, climate and resources. So the Andes Mountains, as you see. Uh, if the weather is coming in from the west, it, the mountains will stop the uh, clouds, and the clouds will rain. So quite often on the uh, windward side of of uh, of certain um, uh, atmospheric patterns, on the windward side there will be a lot of rain, and from the satellite photo you see that it's quite green. Um, so normally on one side of a mountain, it'll be quite green, quite verdant. And on the other side, it will be um, more desolate and have uh, less, uh, less plant life, for example. That's quite common. But also we should say uh, that this upwelling of the geosphere causes not only uh, destructive things like volcanoes, but uh, volcanoes, uh, have a lot of heavy metals. Yeah, so th so I said iron is like three or four percent of our soil is iron. That's the highest percentage of any metal in our soil. Why? Because it's a light, it's a light metal. Heavy metals are heavier, like gold and copper and uranium. Uh, no, iron maiden's a heavy metal. <laughs> that's that's outside of this. <laughs> that's a very uh, funny one, Peter. Uh, so I I know you're uh, listening. That's good. But uh, gold and platinum, they are much heavier. And because of that, they are not on the Earth's surface. So this upwelling pushes the heavy metals to the surface. So that's why um, extinct volcanoes, um, old mountains, they are the most productive. And why? Why old mountains? Why don't we go digging in the, Him in the Himalayas? Why old mountains, not new mountains? No, it's not political. Anybody have an idea? Huh? It's definitely a technical reason why we look at old mountains. So in the United States, the uh, uh, the, the Rocky Mountains, which are quite old. Yeah, it's, it's sur exactly. So what happens is you have young mountains. They're still very, very tall. The Himalayas are tall because they're young. Because they're young, they tall. But um, eventually, as mountains age, they get worn away. They get worn away by the by water. They get worn away by the weather. They get worn away by um, uh, organisms. Uh, they, it just gets worn away. A mountain gets worn away very slowly, but uh, it gets worn away. And as it gets worn away, layer, layer, layer gets peeled off. And the old uh, mountains, the metals are much closer to the surface. So that's why. The most productive, uh, for example, is Utah, which is a volcano. Yeah, they got 
got windswept. I mean, U Utah doesn't have any volcanoes anymore. They're very, 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 very old volcanoes. Like, uh, I don't know, um, 100 million years old, very old volcanoes. Okay, summary. This is the last bit. Um, so we have, let's go take it all the way back, where there's been lots of research uh, going over at least several centuries uh, of, of looking at uh, the fossil record and geography that proves that uh, plate tectonics um, works. Uh, the Earth's uh, lithosphere, which is the, which litho just means rock, so the rock uh, sphere, is broken into pieces called tectonic plates. The plates can move apart, in which case it's a divergent boundary, and that can create seafloor, that can create lakes, or they can come together, and this quite often creates volcanic mountains, major earthquakes, because this happens along the coast, and, and that's the most heavily part of our land is the coastland. They can also slide horizontally, that's the third one, that's called a transform. Uh, it also creates earthquakes, and they, uh, they're, they're not as many of the transform ones as, uh, as uh, the others. Plates also uh, localize volcanic and seismic activity, um, and which of course interacts with the biosphere, the climate, so uh, clouds for example will form, and the availability of resources, so copper mines, um, platinum mines. So that is the presentation for today. Yeah. Let me just uh, stop the...